Well, thank you so much, Theo, for um, welcoming everyone and for the housekeeping. Um, also, welcome from my side. I'm really delighted to be here with all of you and share the first panel of our postgraduate student conference. I think it's really a, a fantastic opportunity, not only for, for students to present their ongoing academic work and to have this forum to do so, but also for us um, as the audience to learn about new and exciting research ideas that are coming up in, in our field. And it's also a wonderful space, I would say, or hopefully so, um, for more seasoned scholars to be supportive and to give constructive feedback to students, something that perhaps uh, many of us lacked uh, when we did our graduate students. Um, at least it was uh, my case. So I welcome everyone. And um, please also keep in mind uh, that some of our presenters will be presenting for the first time in an academic setting. Um, so please be patient with them. And I'm sure they'll do, uh, all of you, you'll do fantastic. Some of you have uh, much more experience and others have less experience, but um, just be mindful of, uh, um, of the fact that some of us are, um, are uh, newcomers to these spaces. Um, and we're lucky to kickstart our conference today with only two papers uh, instead of three or four, uh, which I think is great because it will give us ample time for, for questions and for discussion. And um, as you know, the presenters will be giving their papers uh, in 15 to 20 minutes. I, I heard from Magdalena that she might uh, meet 22, which is fine. We have enough time. Uh, and um, it's great that, that she's also aware of how much time exactly she needs, <laughs> but I'll make sure that um, I'll be, be keeping the time um, for, for us to, to stay on schedule. Um, and as I said, we'll have plenty of time for questions and comments for each of the papers. Um, today, we'll be listening to um, two PhD candidates at different stages of their academic career. One is at the beginning uh, of this journey and the other one rather at the end, um, but also two very different research projects. So it's an interesting um, panel or an interesting session in the sense that we'll need to find ways on how to connect these two um, um, papers. Um, but I'm, I'm excited about uh, both topics. Um, and it will lead probably to uh, uh, unique issues and questions. The first presenter is um, Janelle Shulo, who is an American yoga educator and former Catholic nun. Uh, Janelle holds uh, an MAD in interdisciplinary education with a specialization in yoga studies. And her scholarly interests include religious belief and meaning making, modern yoga, critical pedagogy, and the role of somatic education in self-awareness. And uh, she's working toward her PhD in educational studies at Lesley University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And our second speaker uh, is Magdalena Kraler, who is uh, at the very final stages of her PhD um, she wrote her dissertation under the guidance of Carl Bayer here in Vienna, right? Um, and due to, to the pandemic, uh, we haven't had a chance to meet, even though we're both here in Vienna. Uh, and she will be presenting part of her research on pranayama and occultism today and more in yoga. We will start, as I said, with Janelle who will be talking today about her PhD project on the subject of uh, adult education and yoga teacher trainings with the interesting question of whether yoga can be understood as a pedagogy and what that implies. She has titled her talk, Residential Yoga Teacher Trainings, Adult Learners and Yoga as a Pedagogy that Transforms? Question mark. 
Janelle, welcome. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Warren. I'm going to share my screen with you. Fantastic. So I want to begin by thanking the SOAS Yoga Studies community for hosting this event. I, I also want to acknowledge the work of Laura Douglas and Linda Shadio, whose work has contributed to the beginnings of my scholarship. So my name is Janelle, and I'm a first year PhD candidate in the School of Education at Lesley University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The title of my paper, Residential Yoga Teacher Trainings, Adult Learners, and Yoga as Pedagogy That Transforms? Question mark. So this initial research is directional toward discerning the research questions and then methods that will focus my dissertation. I'm going to divide the next 15 minutes into three segments. First, some background and definitions, then some initial research and preliminary results, and finally, questions and thoughts toward further research directions. A survey of yoga scholarship reveals yoga being framed as an object of research via Western epistemologies, or as an intervention, biomedical or otherwise. Occasionally, yoga is researched as pedagogy. The majority of research considering contemporary yoga as pedagogy focuses on integrating yoga into well-established formal learning institutions. Although adult, non-formal learning contexts are arguably a location where much yoga pedagogy is enacted. The now ubiquitous destination yoga teacher training is one such site. Yet literature about adults' motivation for attending such trainings is often confined to tourism studies. So what is yoga as pedagogy? Pedagogy is concerned with the nature of learning, which is to say that pedagogy is the theory and practice of education. Pedagogy, pedagogy asks us as educators to consider what is the role of the teacher, what is the role of the student, and what is the role of the content? Is the teacher's role that of a knowledge holder, a sage on the stage? Is the student's role that of a passive recipient? Brazilian educator Paulo Freire called this the banking method of education in his 1969 Pedagogy of the Oppressed. What is the role of the content? Is knowledge an unchanging truth passed down by powerful authorities through a sacred lineage? Is knowledge constructed through exchange in learning communities? Contemporary yoga is replete with competing educational epistemologies. Adult learning is a field of study called andragogy Malcolm Knowles defined andragogy as the art and science of helping adults to learn. Most adult learning theorists emphasize the centrality of experience in adult learning processes. In terms of adult learning and yoga as pedagogy, we might look at ways in which yoga is, for some adults, a theory and practice of facilitating learning. Some early questions are, which adults are pursuing yoga for learning? Who are they? And what kind of learning? 
what are potentially diverse populations of adult learners asking of yoga? This first analysis centers one group of adult learners in a destination yoga teacher training here in Costa Rica. The data was readily available and I had established relationships with the research participants. A yoga teacher training is an example of an adult continuing education program tied to a certification. What follows is a first analysis of 200 destination yoga teacher training application forms collected over a five year period in which applicants were asked to describe their life circumstances and motivation for attending a destination yoga teacher training in Costa Rica. A beginning analysis of the demographic revealed that out of 200 intake forms, 36 countries were represented, with the largest groupings of applicants from the United States, Costa Rica, Canada, Germany, the UK, and Switzerland. The average applicant age was 24 to 32, with a second smaller concentration between 45 and 52 years of age. Application forms were reviewed utilizing reflective thematic analysis as described by Virginia Braun and Victoria Clark to identify patterns of meaning across the data set. Patterns were identified through a process of data familiarization, data coding, and theme development and revision, which is still ongoing. Themes are understood as patterns of shared meaning underpinned by a central concept or idea. This method was chosen because the initial research questions related to people's understanding and their representation. Specifically, what is this group of adult learners asking to know of yoga? What kind of learning does yoga represent to them? What is this group of adult learners asking to know from a destination yoga teacher training? What kind of learning does the training represent? When asked to describe their motivations, hopes, goals, and aspirations, 179 applicants by, began by referring to yoga as a practice, specifically a practice of knowing oneself. Self was often referred to expansively with combined terms such as body, mind, and spirit. As C from Brazil described, yoga helps me a lot. It's more than just body stretching and workout. It's a way to self-awareness, physical, mental, and spiritual. 171 applicants spoke about the destination yoga teacher training as a time of deepening and connection, a time to deepen one's personal yoga practice, a time to deepen or connect more deeply with oneself. In the words of E from Denmark, I am mainly here for me to deepen my own yoga practice, to be present with myself, and allow this time for me. During the training, I want to gain clarity on what I want my life to be like and come back with a fresh mind and new visions. In 158 instances, the decision to pursue the training was precipitated by a life-changing event or the urge to make some kind of life change according to Kay from Germany. I need a turn in my life. I was struggling with a lot of things in the last two years. So my motivation is to get clearer of myself. I hope that the training helps me 
to deepen my practice and offers me, offers deep experiences with me, myself, and I. In the words of T from Sweden, since a relationship ended last summer, my life has taken a new direction. I tried yoga for the first time. From that day to another, I started to listen to my inner voice and do changes to make my life better. I've identified myself to become a yoga lady. And 2018 is the year when I dedicated to this and it really helps me to hear my inner voice. For 156 applicants, helping others by eventually teaching was considered secondary to deepening one's personal yoga practice. As C describes, I'd love to expand my knowledge about yoga and its spiritual effect on body and soul. I want to intensify my practice, hopefully improve it, and I hope to have a time full of joy in a group of nice, inspiring people. Yet I don't really know if I want to teach yoga someday, but I want to do this course for myself, to reconnect after a busy time of my education and the shock and mental after effect of an injury, combined with the option to be able to help others and teach my beloved yoga. Returning to the research questions, this initial data and the initial analysis indicated that the majority of the adult learners sampled asked of the destination yoga teacher training the same thing that they asked of yoga, to know themselves. The theme of self-knowing was identified as a central organizing concept for further research. The presence of a life-changing event or the urge to make a life change was identified as a second central organizing concept for continued research. These preliminary themes might be further explored in relation to transformative learning theory, which views experience as central to adult learning and beginning with a disorienting dilemma, shifts from an acquisition of knowledge to learning that fundamentally changes how adults view and experience the world. Narrative interviews might be used to center the voices of the adult learners over time and further reveal the human dilemmas that motivated these learners toward the residential yoga teacher training, as well as to understand what the experience represented to the learners in the years following. Do such trainings help persons look at their identity from new angles, not based in Western paradigms? A reframing of identity is more than a materialist perspective. Relatedly, does the destination training perpetuate a colonialist legacy of going elsewhere to find oneself? And what are the implications when elsewhere is perceived as being within one's own flesh? Education, like much contemporary yoga, is often located at an intersection of the presence of colonization, power, and authority but it is also a location where we can reflect critically on our lives. Further consideration of yoga as pedagogy with adult learners at the center offers an opportunity to consider how a cultural production like yoga enacted in an immersive training environment may or may not change identity and engagement with dominant narratives and mainstream paradigms. 
I hope that by sharing this work at its very earliest stages, I might continue to uncover where and how my own knowledge is partial and open spaces for other modes of knowing and knowledge systems. I welcome your thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. Thank you. And here are some resources, most in the field of adult learning. I'll leave that up for a moment. And we'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, uh, Janelle, for this. First of all, for this wonderful presentation, but also for keeping with the time. Um, <laughs> that's great. And for speaking so clearly, you know, that this is something that not everyone does. Um, we have time for questions, and please, you can send them on Slido. I'm just checking Slido on my phone to see if there are any questions. Um, I don't see any questions right now, if I'm not mistaken. But we, uh, well, of course, we can welcome also the poor to. Have some questions. Um, I'll sneak in if no one else will. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, 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 and, and just, um, it'll hopefully give people um, a chance to, um, to pop up a question or two on the Slido. So whilst people are still thinking, because I think sometimes people do need a couple of minutes. Um, um, but I'm interested, I know this is a really early stage, but I'm always interested uh, as to how researchers in these positions um, manage the positionality of what they do. And I'm sure this is something that Janelle is thinking about already is, uh, because I know it was a big factor in my own, in my own PhD of how, uh, how are you thinking about your position within these communities and how you manage that as someone who's been doing this work yourself for a long time? Okay. Um, in terms of positionality, so the, the question is how, how mm. you know, what is the strategy for, um, for uh, uh, revealing uh, positionality? And I, I think, you know, one, one way to do that is, you know, I know for me to say, you know, this, this is where I am. You know, this is, this is my standpoint um, as, you know, someone who's been in the academy, but who also, you know, operates yoga teacher trainings. So, you know, why, why do I have access to 200 intake forms? It's because I'm the one who received them as the yoga educator um, in that context. And I think that's very important to bring into the conversation going forward, obviously, um, to say this is, you know, this is what I do and where I do it and how I do it. And, um, you know, give, give the opportunity for that um, to be part of the, this course. Does that... Uh, yeah, I think it, no, it, it, it does. And, and I'm also slightly asking because I know this is work that, that Borin's done as well on like at these roles of dual kind of practitioner scholar and, and how they work. So I kind of, you know, I wanted to kind of open that up for, <laughs> for Borin as well, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To be the practitioner scholar and educator. I'll, I'll exactly. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, there's one question um, on Slido which is how is yoga defined in this pedagogy? And I think that's, that's sort of a, a, a key question, uh, but also opening a Pandora box, right? What, what do we even think yoga is or what does yoga mean in this particular context? How is yoga defined in this yeah. pedagogy? Yeah. So um, I'm, thinking of, uh, I'm thinking of this line from, jo uh, quote from Joseph Alter that I often think of. Uh, in which he speaks about uh, yoga as, um, you know, the, the I, I don't want to misquote him, so I'll speak for myself, uh, as a production of those who enact it. So, you know, as persons are you know, creating this cultural production, which I believe is an ongoing creation, um, 
and, and saying, this is yoga. I think it, it, the question really goes to the adult who is enacting it, in, the adult who comes into a training program or who perceives a training program. You know, what is yoga to, you know, each one of those participants is going to be different. And, and so I think that's an important part of explaining the pedagogy. So I'm not saying this is what yoga is. I'm saying, what is yoga to you? And so I'm hearing many, many, many different um, expressions or um, definitions of, of what yoga is in their worlds of meaning and then watching that change. Mm -hmm. I guess part of the question is also not just for the, for the participants who are coming with their own notions of, of yoga and how that gets transformed in this residential or um, um, uh, teacher trainings, but also what are the instructors teaching what yoga is and is supposed to be, mm -hmm. right? That is, of course, also uh, coming from a very particular worldview and a particular context. Um, there is, I think, another question for you. Um, how do you think that adult learning in yoga might differ or find similarities with other kinds of adult learning? How, let me make sure I understand the question, how adult learning um, in, the, in, a, in the context of um, outside of the academy, um, like a non-formal learning situation, uh, adults learning yoga, how that's different uh, possibly than other types of adult learning? Did yeah, so, so, so let me, yeah, I think, I think you got it right, but just, just to make sure I repeat the question, how do you think that adult learning in yoga might differ or find similarities with other kinds of adult learning? Okay. I think, I think it's possible that some similarities, uh, and this is just, I think it might be possible, that some similarities are uh, you know, persons often approach, adults often approach learning for um, personal development. Um, I think that happens in a yoga uh, learning context as well. Uh, certainly that's what the data indicated uh, to me in this first analysis. I think what's kind of unique in the yoga teacher training context, you know, and, and of course that depends Oddly, on the huge variety of yoga teacher training contexts that there are, um, is the body is very much involved in that learning as as a site or a, as a location of knowledge production. Um, I think that often happens or can happen in a yoga teacher training, um, but I think it's quite possible that quite aside from what the pedagogy is in any given yoga teacher training. Adults coming together uh, in a location, kind of away from their normal environment, um, they start to inter interact with one another and start to create uh, new meaning and learning um, amongst, uh, amongst themselves. That, you know, whatever the yoga teacher director of the program does um, could potentially become background to um, another type of learning that's happening um, amongst these adult learners um, as they create a community, you know, wherever they've congregated. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I don't see any further questions on Slido, but I have um, perhaps something to, to share with you. And I think that your approach, uh, which, which focuses on yoga as a pedagogy, pedagogy and, and a sort of embodied or somatic learning, if you will, if I understood you correctly, is quite promising and sort of um, fills the gap that, uh, that only a few have started to, to explore. Um, but also, I think it, it sort of challenges the ways in which we conceive uh, what constitutes knowledge uh, and particularly knowledge worth pursuing academically. So thank you for that. Um, but I do also have a, a few questions as an anthropologist, perhaps, that, that focus, you know, I, I work um, on religious phenomena in India. And, and, and so for me, um, uh, focusing on context very strongly is something that really has helped me to avoid some of the pitfalls of essentializing. And so uh, I would, for example, ask, 
you know, and, and I know you've done some of this uh, groundwork, but, you know, who are these people exactly? Uh, and I mean, not only those who seek out these yoga teacher trainings, but also who are those who teach them? Um, and I mean, not only those who seek these yoga teacher, uh, uh, sorry, and, and so I, I mean, like, what's their background? And I, I know you have some of this data already, you shared some of it, but um, so why does the wellness and tourism industry have so much success among middle-aged white women, right? I mean, I saw some images of men as well in, in, in your slides, but I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of really obvious that the, the um, population in these yoga teacher trainings is of, of, of a particular type, right? So it's young, white, slim, uh, sexy, <laughs> and able-bodied, right? And, and so we, we, if we ask the question, who are these people and why they're there, keeping in, in mind what's also going on in terms of um, uh, other uh, social and cultural processes, I think that would enrich um, your, your project. And uh, since you, meant, you, you, know, you mentioned Josef Alterk, for example, and he has, uh, you know, somatic nationalism, for example, as a concept. So how are um, certain um, ideologies and, and certain, um, for example, class and, and racialized privileges embedded in this learning, right? That they're not, perhaps it, it's not in the curricula, it's not in uh, what people do necessarily uh, uh, um, uh, consciously, but it's part of a habitus to use um, Bourdieu's uh, theory of embodied uh, um, class and, and sort of uh, learning. So I think if you also go into that sociological uh, literature, uh, um, as I'm sure you've, you've already started, that could give it a bit more context in terms of, of um, yeah, a little bit of a sociological grounding. I know you're, uh, your studies are in um, um, pedagogy and educational, you're doing a, a PhD on education, but I think these this, uh, other issues might help you uh, give it a little bit more of a grounding. Um, yeah, that's, that was not really a question, but more of a comment, I guess, um, as a suggestion. I see there's one more, one more question or two actually, and then uh, we'll, we'll have to move on to, to Magdalena. But, um, so, um, since your data points to, to the central theme as transform self for self, does transformation of self as teacher happen simultaneously? Hmm. I'm, I'm trying to understand the question. So if the data is the data's pointing toward transformation and what was what was the rest of it? So if self-transformation is at the core of, of, of your um, um, data, of your mm -hmm. data points, uh, whether uh, the transformation of self as teacher also happens simultaneously. Mm -hmm. it, it's, I'm, my sense is some, yes, that, that part of the transformation is a transformation into and, I, and I'm not sure the data is, this data tells me this. I think probably looking at what persons say after the experience is more likely to tell, to, to give this insight. Um, so that means I'm guessing uh, at a little bit, you know, is, is the change more I'm coming in to transform my, for my own self knowing, um, and then potentially, uh, some shifts happens into the role of teacher in which one per one perceives um, others, and how do I create a uh, experience or a context for others to have, you know, to, to uh, have some kind of tr transformation or have to learn something new. So a focus change of focus from self to other potentially would that be transformational? I would think so. Um, I think I would need to look more at you know, what people say after the experience to give a more definitive answer about that. So that's a guess. Thank you, Janelle. We have a couple of, uh, 
a couple more questions, but I think we'll take just one more. And then um, once we, we finish with Magdalena's session, we can still, if we still have time, we can come back to some of these questions. So the last question for you, uh, Janelle, would be, do you address the similarities or difference, differences in modern yoga learning from the Guru Shishya traditional learning of yoga? Is India also a focus of study? It's certainly it's outside of my realm of study. Uh, I'm focusing really on this this one particular training and this one and the data that's available to me in it. Um, I hope that it, it might open interest for others uh, to do similar work because I would really like to know what um, what those findings would be. Wonderful. Thank you. So I think we'll close the, the, the session for now uh, and we'll move on to Magdalena's presentation. Thank you so much, Janelle, uh, for, for sharing with us so far. And uh, as, as, I, as I said at the end of the session, we can come back to some of um, these other questions. For now, uh, let's uh, welcome Magdalena Kraler, who is a, a, a scholar here at the University of Vienna who is working on uh, esotericism and occultism and yoga um, and has uh, some really excited, exciting uh, research to share with us. Um, and so the, 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 the title of her talk is um, The Occult in Modern Yoga, a case study of the latent light culture and yogic breath cultivation, Pranayama, 1905. 1935. Please join me in welcoming Magdalena. Thanks so much, Borain, for handing over, introducing me, and also for uh, to Janelle for starting off so wonderfully. Um, I would actually like to begin this talk by thinking of um, Swami Maheshanandaji of uh, the Kaivalya Tama Yoga Institute. Um, who actually passed away today. Um, um, so he is, um, anybody who, who, was, who, who met him will know how, wonderfully, um, it, how wonderful it, is to be, it was to be around him and his teachings were really deeply inspiring and I would like to dedicate this talk to him. He was inspiring for me as well. Okay, I will start to share my screen now and start my talk. Can you see this? Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so as Borain has pointed out, my PhD thesis on, is on pranayama in the modern period, um, but so it's, I want to make clear that it is a historical study that ends around 1940. And um, so today I will present only on one chapter that I deal with, or uh, in which I deal with the intersection of modern yoga and the occult. And um, so this paper basically deals with three main pillars. Just a second. Three main pillars, uh, which are modern yoga, the occult, and yogic breath cultivation, all mentioned in the title. I will start explaining what I mean by these three important terms. I will then delve into giving examples of how these three pillars merge within a particular occult society, the latent light culture in South India. So really briefly, what do I mean? Oh, sorry. What do I mean by uh, modern yoga? The term modern yoga points at a shift that happened in the history of yoga roughly from 1850 onwards. As several scholars have shown, this shift happened in India but was triggered by transnational influence into colonial India that informed the practices. Major influences were medical science, psychology, and discourses of the natural sciences. Deciding factors for disseminating yogic theory and practices were the translation of Sanskrit yoga texts into English, as well as their availability um, through print media. 
Hindu reform movements like the Arya and Brahma Samaj promoted yoga as a universal science and Hinduism as a superior religion. All these developments accelerated by the 1880s and the Theosophical Society, which was a transnational occult movement, was a major player in the reinvention of modern yoga. Which leads me to explaining, to explaining what I mean by the occult or 19th century occultism. The Theosophical Society is part of a broader phenomenon that is often labeled 19th century occultism. Other important movements in this rather broad category are spiritism, mesmerism, and new thought. All of these relevant at first in Euro-American contexts. The most salient features of these movements are the belief in a universally distributed principle, a fluid or often ether, and its influx on the human being. And these movements emphasize the acquisition of latent powers, as well as the inquiry into paranormal, paranormal phenomena like clairvoyance and astral travel. These phenomena were seen as part of one's occult path to unite oneself with the divine source. These movements were often orga organized as secret so secretive societies in so-called lodges or orders. And we are mainly concerned here with two strands, one being the Theosophical Society founded by Helena Blavatsky and Henry Alcott in 1875. You can see them on the pictures here um, in New York and they relocated to India in 1878. So um, this movement was influential for the latent light culture to which I will turn later. And the second strand um, is the New Thought movement starting to become influential by the 1880s in North America. And it was mainly interested on a practical level in curing the body through the mind. A typical method still quite common today were affirmation te techniques like asserting oneself, I'm healthy, I'm creative, etc., like positive thinking affirmations, as well as hands-on and distant healing. Hands-on healing was accomplished by the above-mentioned magnetic substance, often the mesmeric fluidum. We see a typical healing procedure in the upper right um, picture, which is entitled treatment for headache with one hand at the back of the head and the other at the solar plexus, uh, which was said to be one of the most receptive body areas to absorb this magnetic current. By the 1900s, these techniques were enhanced through specific breathing techniques, here depicted in lying position, for stimulating the solar plexus. In this case, it was a specific technique of inhaling into the chest and then pushing out the abdomen, as you can see in this dotted line. An umbrella term for recharging oneself through breathing was rhythmic breathing. Rhythmic breathing meant to render inhalation and exhalation of the same length, including the pauses in between. The energy so inhaled and stored uh, could then be conveyed to others. So what has all this to do with pranayama or to ask differently, what do I mean by yogic breath cultivation? Along with yoga's shift during the 19th century, there is also a major one within pranayama, which is commonly transferred as breath control. Pranayama is enormously significant within pre-modern yoga. It is mentioned in all Ashtanga and Chardanga systems of yoga. It is the fourth limb in Patanjala yoga and also in tantric systems, it's often the first limb of yoga. In Hatha yoga, it mainly denotes breath retention or kumbhaka and controlling the breath, reducing its frequency as well as stopping it is crucial to achieve higher states of yoga. However, developments within modern yoga led to a broader understanding of the term pranayama. Pranayama becomes less so associated with breath retention, but can denote various forms of what I term cultivation, including observing the breath, calming the breath, making it rhythmic and continuous. I cannot go into all the details of these changes, but it is relevant to note that there are several techniques imported and subsumed under the term pranayama, like deep breathing or the aforementioned rhythmic breathing or terms borrowed from medical discourses like diaphragmatic breathing or clavicular breathing. 
I therefore subsume all these terms under the broader category yogic breath cultivation. Most modern practices are probably less, also less vigorous than pre-modern ones, and there is a tendency to simplify the practices along with modern yoga's conquest. Also pranayama techniques are transnationally disseminated. For example, in the German occult movement, a picture that is taken from one of these books of German occultism. Okay, after having sketched like the main pillars on which this study rests, I will now introduce uh, the main feature of this talk, which is, um, which is occultism um, after 1900, uh, which was an important stage to enact yogic breath cultivation. The Theosophical Society had a considerable pan-Indian impact, and particularly so in South India and in Tamil Nadu. And an offshoot of the Theosophical Society was the Latent Light Culture, or LLC, which was founded in 1905 by Sanjeevi, who you can see here on this picture, um, in Tinne Valley, uh, Tamil Nadu. Its main, so the Society's main publishing organ, was the occult magazine, the Kalpaka, first edition, 1908. The society also offered correspondence courses from the outset, which was part of its economic income. So the earliest correspondence courses focused on topics that were like inherently occult, like telepathy, hypnotism, clairvoyance, and so on. And correspondence courses were mailed to students and were supposed to and they were supposed to study on their own rather than in a group. And thus also secrecy was kept up in, within the society. And it was a typical form to disseminate occult teachings even in 19th century America and the LLC adopted this uh, form of teaching. So despite its focus on 19th century occultism in its early correspondence courses, the latent light culture understood itself as an ambassador of ancient yoga that was understood to be inherently occult. In other words, yoga and occultism were synonymous to the members of the latent light culture. An important notion to link the two, two genres was prana, which can be translated as breath or vital principle, but it was here often linked um, to the mesmeric fluidum that pervades the universe. Uh, the Kalpaka symbol is a wish fulfilling tree, as you can see on the picture, and it symbolizes the society's yield of occult and yogic knowledge. The society exists until today, but was relocated to Allahabad in Delhi in the 1950s. Another influential person who likely collaborated with the latent light culture should be introduced, and it's the New Thought author William Walker Atkinson published under various pseudonyms, one of them being Yogi Ramacharaka. Next to New Thought practices, he also incorporated physical culture and American delsatism into his books on yoga. These propelled the dissemination of physical culture inflected breath practices within modern yoga. The main publishing organ of Yogi Ramacharaka was the Yogi Publication Society based in Chicago, and it actually functioned like a portal between the societies because also the latent light colleges books were published by the Yogi Publication Society, and in turn Ramacharaka's books were distributed in India by LLC. Up to the present, the society holds Atkinson in great esteem for explaining yoga to a broader audience. Among the most influential Ramacharaka books is the Hindu Yogi Science of Breath uh, of 1903-1904, which was originally written as correspondence lessons. Uh, notably in this and other texts, Ramacharaka explicitly equated prana and the mesmeric fluidum, which was similarly done by Vivekananda, but not as explicit. One of the most relevant techniques in this context is rhythmic breathing for beginners in the ratio 6363, six, so inhale, retain, exhale, retain in this ratio. Um, if it is combined with specifically directing the will, it is termed psychic breathing used, for example, to charge water, to cast a protective aura of pranic force around oneself, and to heal oneself and others. The nerve vitalizing breath combines breathing with movements of the limbs. For example, nerve vitalizing breath looks something like this.
okay? Uh, looks a bit weird with the camera. Um, and it's only one form to uh, combine the movement of, of the limbs, but that was an example for the nerve vitalizing breath. And all of these were incorporated into the correspondence teachings of the LLC, as we will see. I will now give a few examples of how yoga and occultism was blended in the advanced course of mental sciences and finer forces, a correspondence course written by Sanjeevi in 1929 with the first edition 1925. The correspondence course comprises 99 exercises in seven chapters and treats various stages of yoga, which are referred to as Gata Yoga, Hatha Yoga, Laya Yoga, and others. Significantly, the first chapter is on prana or life, which is then equated to personal magnetism. So here another link between prana and magnetism fluidum. But we are mainly concerned here with Gata Yoga and Laya Yoga because in terms of Gata, it contains so Gata, the yoga of the physical body. It contains several lessons on breath cultivation with the aim to cleanse the nadis and prepare for higher practices. Like Atkinson's lessons, here we also find rhythmic breathing. Then rhythmic psychological breathing is also meant to cast a protective aura. And the nadi invigorating breath, this one, in Sanchivi's works is a direct replica of Atkinson's nerve vitalizing breath, with the only exception that the term nadi is replaced by nerves. Ah, the other way around, nerves is replaced by nadi. In brief, seven, in seven of the 10 exercises in this chapter are directly taken from Atkinson. The remainder of the chapter then describes Hatha Yogi Pranayama like Surya Bhedana, Ujjayi, Shitali, and Pastrika. Um, typical occult and new thought inspired usages of breath cultivation are then found in the chapter on Laya Yoga, the yoga of dissolution, but here also called Thought Yoga clearly inspired again by Atkinson and his wider circle to which also Sydney Flower belong, Sanjeevi advises to use rhythmic breathing for distant healing and hands-on healing like in the, the way that we have seen before, but also distant healing. He also incorporates the health breath, um, which is basically Kumbhaka as found in Adelia Fletcher's The Law of Rhythmic Breath um, for curing various ailments, which is by the way, another American New Thought author inspired by yoga. To give a, a more well-rounded argument, I briefly refer to another text by Sanjeevi, first published in 1933. In a translation and extensive commentary on the Shiva Svarodaya, Sanjeevi dissects several texts of yogis and occultists before him. Rama Prasad had first translated the Shiva Svarodaya into English in The Science of Breath and the Philosophy of the Tattvas, Nature's Finer Forces of 1890, a famous and influential text. The Shiva Svarodaya itself is a medieval text on prognostication through observing the breath flow or svara in the nostril, so depending on where the breath flows in or out, you can prognosticate your own health and also future events. In a style that is not unlike Madame Blavatsky's, Sanjeevi heavily polemizes against Prasad's, Vivekananda's, and Kuvalyananda's understanding of Svara, Prana, and Pranayama. On the other hand, on the other hand, Sanjeevi recommends the Pranayama teachings. Ha, huh, this little slide here. <laughs> Uh, the pranayama teachings of the occultist Alistair Crowley for, quote, average Westerners and modern day Easterners, so also for Indians, surprisingly, in his commentary on the Shiva Svarodaya. He draws on Crowley's texts on pranayama that appeared in the Equinox. Although there is some debate around that, Alistair Crowley in turn may have even learned pranayama from a guru connected to the late and light culture in Mathurai, Tamil Nadu, during his stay in India in 1904. If he did, the British occultist Crowley certainly added his own interpretation of pranayama. In the passage quoted by Sanjeevi, Crowley first recommends building up a ratio matra for, or matra for alternate nostril breathing, which is written here. 
And then Crowley continues the practice in more creative ways, as you can see in the next quote, leading it into a kind of dance induced by the rhythm of the breath, guided by a mantra or a mantra. First walking, then dancing in this ryth rhythm, one may likely experience a dance that becomes independent of the will. While pre-modern yoga, particularly tantric strands, often combined pranayama with the silent recitation of mantra, Crowley introduces a new, and in my opinion, interesting element, the dance. Although it should be noted already Atkinson described walking in a specific, specific rhythm of the breath. Some of, the, some of Crowley's recommendations were, however, less gentle. He was one of the few advocates of modern yogic breath cultivation to explicitly insist on vigorous practice as he aims to demonstrate in these pictures. <laughs> he's so vigorous that he's not, you know, you can see him trembling and the picture is not clear. In one of the latest correspondence courses written by Sanjeevi, he aimed to return to inher inherent yogic wisdom. The Holy Order of Krishna correspondence course interpreted the wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita. And this yogic lore was occultism. As you can see here, it's absolutely synony synonymous for him. Moreover, the holy order of Krishna had several grades that required initiation into the perennial wisdom that was universally taught by Krishna and others. It was thus organized like, organized like a secretive order, but still disseminating itself through correspondence courses. I would argue that the works of Sanjeevi and the latent light culture perfectly exemplify how, in some contexts, yoga and occultism were in strictly linked to the point that they became synonymous. The breath practices incorporated into the teachings of the latent light culture further exemplify this. And prana is a key notion to link yoga and occultism. Yoga and occultism are then interpreted as perennial, exclusive, elitist, hence in the best sense esoteric and occult knowledge. For this novel interpretation of yoga, some of the most influential occultists of the 19th and 20th century, Blavatsky, Atkinson, and Crowley, are no minor protagonists. San Sanjeevi stands on the shoulders of these, understanding himself as an advocate of yoga cum occultism. Due to the influence of the Kalpaka and, co and the correspondence courses, which were also disseminated in American New Thought circles in Chicago and other areas. The LLC's influence is not to be neglected. Also, the influential occult network headed by Crowley and his occult society, the AA, was in touch with the latent light culture, as Henrik Bogdan has shown. And they learned, so Crowley, um, Crowley students in turn learned from the LLC. Moreover, modern yogis like Chivananda and Yogacharya Sundaram drew on the LLC's teachings. The Kalpaka was, however, not the only yogic occult journal, but similar ones were the Hindu, for example, the Hindu spiritual magazine published from 1906 onwards in Kolkata, and the journal Self Culture published from 19 on, 1909 onwards. And they evidence infinite variations, almost infinite variations to combine the occult and yoga. These interwoven strands informed yoga at least until the 1950s. Then the impact of the occult in modern yoga is dwindling due to tendencies of secularization and yoga becoming increasingly part of popular culture. Here is a list of primary sources that I used if anybody wants to check and Thanks a lot for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you and so I'll much, Magdalena, for that, for that wonderful uh, and really detailed talk. Um, we have a good 15 minutes until we finish um, our session today. Um, so please send your questions 
uh, on Slido. I'm going to open my Slido again and see which questions are coming in. All right, so I have one question that continues into two. It looks like you've delved into some really interesting primary source material. Can you talk a little about the process you went through to locate, read, interpret, and determine what was most relevant for your study? Well, thanks. What a wonderful ref reflecting question. Um, I appreciate it. Um, yes, I think I would say it was quite a process. <laughs> It was like starting out with reading Vivekananda Saracha Yoga and not knowing what is what. And then I really um, tried to just disentangle what's going on. And thanks to my to the great guidance of my supervisor, Carl Bayer, I also um, realized how important the occult um, movements were for um reinterpreting prana for example in prana is such a central i didn't focus too much on prana in this talk but it's such a central notion um in my for for my study and it's a com it's complex because it reaches back to the vedic time and then all the occult movement comes in and additionally i found it so helpful to have like a seven months uh, archival research um period in india where i also was at Kaivalya Dharma Yoga Institute. So uh, the Swamiji I mentioned, I met there during my um, during my archival research at Kaivalya Dharma and then at the Theosophical Society headquarters in Adya, which is a wonderful library. And then I went on to Kolkata, finding more um, libraries with all the material of the like 1880s onwards. So they don't have books of the 1850s there unfortunately it's falling apart but 1880 to 1940 was just so much rich material and yeah and in time i found what was really a coming up more and more like repeatedly coming up in my research so i started to pull that out and so so the occult is really i highlight that in one chapter of my thesis but on the other hand it's also laced through the whole thesis okay i hope that answers your question. Thank you, Magdalena. Um, there is one more question for you from on Slido, um, which is two more actually, but I'm going to ask the first one. Interested to hear if Crowley's eight lectures on yoga have made any impact on modern yoga. Okay, um, I have to say I didn't uh, research Crowley in depth but I only looked at the quotes that were used by Dr. Sanjeevi in his um, Shiva Svarodaya comment. And um, as far as I have seen, I think the eight lectures on yoga um, reproduce some of his earlier mat um, material that he published in the Equinox. And um, which I actually quoted in part with the dance aspect. And I can say that um, there are still occult movements still practicing uh, yoga or yogic occult practices today, although they are quite minor, like in terms of numbers of practitioners, it's more secretive still. Um, but I wouldn't say that Crowley's um, uh, teachings had like a broad impact on, on the broad um, uh, group of practitioners worldwide. It's much more people like, yeah, the more famous ones in yoga, obviously, like Kuvalyananda was huge, and then Shivananda, but also Yogendra. And of course, the basic prana theory we have basically up to date is um, shaped by Vivekananda. Thank you. Thank you for so much for that question. There's another one from Hagar, which is, what is the main implication for occultism and yoga to become synonymous? Was there a historical moment that caused this transition? Um, I th so seeing it becoming synonymous really as clearly I have only seen in Sanjeevi's work, which is also why it, I'm quite fascin fascinated by it. But then I would also have to state that um, 
the early theosophists Blavatsky and Alcott and others mainly conceived um, they, so they understood themselves to be occultists, but they also had a strong interest in yoga, especially initially. And so um, there was the, one could say, the historical moment of um, calling uh, yoga, for example, equating it with mesmerism, which is another important um, occult strand in the 19th century, highly influential. And so there is this equation already there in the uh, Theosophical Society. But then the, I also have to say that the Theosophists also um, kind of shattered that a bit and they were mainly conceived themselves as occultists, not so much as yogis. Although the Indian, the Indian Theosophists were quite, they were under, understood themselves as doing both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Um, there's one more question for you and then um, we can go back to um, also uh, Janelle and maybe try right. to bridge those two for in the last um, few minutes. Do you think uh, the occult influence on pranayama is very evident in modern yoga practices? It's an interesting question. Um, so as I said, and in the research period that I'm researching until the 1940s, I would say it's it's very strong and one of the main characters as i pointed out is atkinson because also sanjivi eh, shivananda absorbs all the atkinson teachings and atkinson is so occult and so that also is really strong and so or maybe um in if you if we conceive the field a, a bit wider you probably have heard about the term that is pranic healing which is sending energy to other people either distant or hands-on so maybe this reminds you of something it's actually termed uh, coined the term by Atkinson and and so um, and then uh, I would say that pranayama or yogic breath cultivation is really an evolving field and it's still negotiated what is part of it so there are there are teachers that think it's very narrow and it's we should only practice hatha yogi pranayama so there is not much occult in there like in the school of Kovalyananda. but then uh, i i mentioned other examples where there is and uh, and i would say the the idea how people think of prana as a universal principle and all that is still very much there and it has occult implications thank you so thank much you <laughs> Wonderful. So we have uh, five more minutes and uh, I'd like to go back to uh, Janelle. There's one more question that remained unanswered from the public, which is, what do you believe has been the social justice reflections um, of adult learners in yoga? <laughs> okay, let me think about that one moment. Sure. Social re so the social justice reflection reflections is that was that the word? Yeah. The uh, what do you believe has been the social justice reflections of adult learners in yoga? Mm. I, I'm thinking of, about movements in modern postural yoga um, in which, you know, practitioners have uh, spoken about, I'm taking my yoga off the mat. Um, and this, the increased, um, you know, interest in um, creating inclusive uh, environments and you know, kind of bridging. I'm thinking about the conversation we had a moment ago in which, um, you know, what happens when an adult learner potentially starts to move into a role of educator and sees, um, sees oneself as part of the human family rather than, you know, how will yoga help me personally? And, you know, if that starts to happen, you know, it, in an in, in adult learner's life, um, potentially through yoga, 
um, and they start to one starts to see oneself as part of a human family. Um, one is going to um, act quite differently um, in terms of uh, you know how one is with you know care for our whole human family. Right. Thank you. Could be great implication. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think it's a question you can also take with you and to let it, you know, um, boil a little longer on your stove. <laughs> um, and perhaps uh, because we're, we're running out of time just to, to maybe link the two presentations of today um, and, and a point that, that you that you touched upon, uh, Magdalena, is wouldn't it perhaps be fruitful to consider um, the findings from research being carried out, for example, by Magdalena and other scholars in the field of esotericism, occultism, spiritualism, New Age, and so on and so forth, and the larger historical processes to better understand the, the legacies and the modern in interpretations of modern yoga and spirituality. In other words, also to see, you know, the curriculum that, you know, is being taught at places like Costa Rica and yoga teacher trainings and, you know, the understanding of prana and, I don't know, the, the chakras and whatnot. And that's being transmitted from, from one generation to the next. And uh, if we sort of look back and, and try to map out, you know, where these discourses come from, um, how would that also impact, um, you know, your teaching, for example, or the teaching of other um, um, educators? Um, in, in other words, how would educators educate themselves about what they're doing in a way? Um, I think that's perhaps a, a question that we can all ponder about. Another, another would be, of course, how is knowledge produced and transmitted, which is uh, what, what is knowledge anyhow within the academic context, but then um, um, uh, uh, transposing that to, for example, um, occultist or esoteric milieus or in the new age uh, sort of uh, contexts, right? Uh, and globalized yoga. Um, but before I go, uh, or before we all go, I'd like to uh, make a small uh, announcement because I know that uh, Magdalena will also be presenting soon at the end of July in a, um, a panel at the EXAS conference that will be held here in Vienna, uh, as I said, at the end of the month. And she will be presenting at a panel entitled Occult South Asia, Rethinking the History of Modern South Asian Religious and Spiritualities Through the Lens of Esotericism, Research and Vice Versa. Uh, and so she will be contributing there and, uh, and, and many other uh, uh, great scholars of, of, uh, around this topic. Um, and so Me too. For those... Sorry? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yes, you too, of course. Raphael Voix and I got an email this week reminding us that we were presenting at the conference. So now we have to write our papers. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So there, there are um, a number of, of papers, uh, uh, specifically on the occult in South Asia, but uh, also on yoga. And you're all welcome to, to follow that conversation. And of course, we have um, uh, just kick-started our conference here uh, um, for the post-graduate conference. And we have three more sessions or two more sessions, no, three more sessions. And, and so uh, please join us in the following days. Um, thank you so much uh, for your participation. Thank you, uh, Janelle. Thank you, Magdalena. And thank you, Vicky thank you. And, and Theo and everyone for, for joining us. Is there anything you'd like to say, Theo, before we go? No, not really. Just to remind people, our next session is Wednesday. Uh, we're making it easy by keeping all the sessions at the same time. Um, so it'll be seven o'clock to eight fifteen again. And uh, Wednesday is Jim. I think he has he has four pack four papers to get through uh, on Wednesday. So we'll be a little more tight for time. Um, but yeah, and also for myself to say again, thank you, Janelle and Magdalena, for two great papers and a really nice way to start us off. And well done. It's not easy to do this. Um, and you did great. <laughs>